Thank you. It's, uh, it's a great personal honor for me to be here and to be able to speak here in this, to this group, to this agenda, in this venue. So we'll get the slides. Get the slides started. Oh, okay. So um, let me, um, to introduce biofortification, that was a perfect introduction by Ingo. Um, I do want to tell you about a success story and how much better the success could be if we could use transgenics. So I, I begin by giving some background about what's been going on in agriculture and to a certain extent I'm repeating uh, in a different form what's already been said. You see this green, this da dash red line across the middle, that's a 100% increase between 1965 and 1999 and you see the blue bar population doubled. So we've heard about the grade increases in cereal yields, those are the orange bars. So we had the green revolution, um, cereal production increased faster than population growth. But what I really want to draw your attention to are the green bars, and that's pulse production. That's just a, that's a, just a marker for vegetables, fruits, um, animal products, the, all the non-staple foods. We had productivity increases, um, but they only increased by 25%, didn't meet the, the same level as the population growth. So this is the perspective that I want to provide. What happens to food prices when you have that kind of a situation? So this shows rice prices. So you see rice prices are now, cereal prices in India are now lower than they were at the start of the Green Revolution. This is a great success. Um, poor people can afford their, their energy, their calories from, from cereals at a lower price. But what I really want to draw your attention to is what happens to the, all the non-staple foods. Um, you see a steady increase over a 45-year period of all the, the non-staple foods. This is the part of the diets that provide quality. They're the foods that are dense in minerals and vitamins. Um, so the prices are going up continuously over time because you didn't have the same increases in production that you had for the cereals. So vitamin A is getting more expensive over time. Iron is getting more expensive over time. Zinc is getting more expensive over time. All the vitamins and minerals are getting more expensive over time. So the poor, if their incomes have not increased, it's getting more and more difficult to afford the better parts of the diet that give you health, um, uh, that give you health. So um, the, again, we see now the, the main, three pu main three public health problems um, that are introduced because of low mineral and vitamin intakes are vitamin A, iron, and zinc deficiencies. You've al we've already seen that the main problems are in South Asia and also in Africa. These are where the, the largest number of people suffer from these deficiencies. So what are some of the consequences of the deficiencies? Um, administration of vitamin A supplements um, in rigorous trials in nine different countries show that they could, you could reduce child mortality at the, uh, in children under five years old. You could reduce mortality by an astonishing, on average, 23%. Iron deficiency impairs cognitive abilities. When the children are iron deficient as infants, as children, it, it permanently impairs their cognitive abilities throughout life. It cannot be reversed. Three out of four children in India who are less than two years old are anemic, and about half of that anemia is attributed to iron deficiency. Zinc deficiency is related to your immune system, impairment of your immune system. It's also related to stunting. It's estimated that there are 450,000 people who die each year due to zinc deficiency. So about two billion people around the world are subject to these deficiencies. So I don't have time to go into any more just to say, you know, these are just some indicative um, uh, figures that, that show what a severe public health problem it is. So how to treat the problem? Well, the, 
the nutrition community reacted when they when they discovered these things uh, 25 to 30 years ago. They reacted by, with supplementation programs. So, for example, 500 million vitamin A supplements are now given out each year to children under five years old. It costs about a dollar per supplement, so it costs about 500 million dollars a year. What do you do next year? You give another 500 million supplements. What do you do the next year? Another 500 million supplements. Over a decade, you've spent $5 billion on supplements, and then you just keep going and going and going. It's not, a, it's not solving the underlying problem. When you work out the numbers for commercial fortification, it's the same, same types of magnitude, same types of recurrent costs. So what, what the um, inside of biofortification is, let's start uh, bringing agricultural solutions into the mix. So um, I use this picture to describe, uh, just in very simple terms, what biofortification is. So Africans eat white maize. They strongly prefer white maize. There's no vitamin A in white maize. Maize is the most widely eaten food staple in Africa. Vitamin A deficiency is a huge public health problem in Africa. There's also yellow maize available. It doesn't actually have very much vitamin A in it. It's for livestock. Um, it's also given as food aid, so there's a strong aversion to the yellow maize. What we've done under Harvest Plus, and it took eight to 10 years to do the science and do the breeding, now we've developed this bright orange maize, which is high in provitamin A. They're just as high yielding as the white maize. Very important that they're just as high yielding as the white mazes. So because they're high yielding, they cost the same price as the white maize. So what's our value proposition to the African mothers? Do you want to continue buying and eating the white maize or for the same price protect your family from vitamin A deficiency by buying and eating the orange maize? So how do they react to that value proposition? Well, the first thing they say is, how does it taste? So we do the blindfold tests, and they, they invariably pick this is the white maize and this is the orange maize because they recognize the difference in the taste. But they like the taste of the orange maize. So once they've done the taste test, then they, then they like the value proposition, and we found that they'll switch, they'll switch over to the, to the orange maize. So in a, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's our vision. 25 years from now, a grandchild will say to the grandmother, did, did maize used to be white? Is there such a thing as white maize? That they'll just, be used, they'll just be used to the orange maize. Carrots used to be white, now they're orange, and we all think carrots were, were always orange. So that's what biofortification is. I'll, oh, I just wanted to mention that you've already had some of the orange maize. They served it at lunch yesterday. We shipped some orange maize over. And we, we, again, I didn't know we again had it for lunch today. That's just a short aside. I hope you like the taste. So what are the, um, what are the comparative, every, every type of intervention has comparative advantages. I don't want to say that we're going to, biofortification is a, is a silver bullet. It's going to push out uh, fortification or supplementation. But the comparative advantage of biofortification is that it starts in the rural areas with the smallholder producers who eat what they produce. That's where 75% of the poor are in the world, so that's where the main problem is. Uh, as surpluses, the, the surpluses make their way into the marketing system, they reach into urban areas. So commercial fortification works best in urban areas where people are, are purchasing their foods. And then the fortified foods reach into the ur ur rural areas as the economies develop. So the two approaches are highly complementary. But the thing that really attracted me, I'm trained as an economist, the thing that attracted to me is that it's very cost effective to get the plants to do the work. You, you spend, your main costs are up front in the Agricultural Research Institutes. You, you develop the basic varieties that are high yielding, that are dense in the nutrients, then you make those lines available to the national agricultural research systems. They're adapted to the growing conditions in the countries. They get out to the farmers. The farmers don't do anything differently. They replace one seed that's non-biofortified with one seed that's biofortified. They put on the same amount of fertilizer, they plow, they harvest just the same. There are no, there are no extra recurrent costs to the farmers. 
So that's the reason why I, I, I went through that calculation of $5 billion for vitamin A supplements. Well, this, the research option uh, and getting this into the system is far lower cost than $5 billion. So it's very cost effective uh, investment. Okay, so that's the, that's the background, that's the justification, but can we, can we make it work? Does it work? Uh, so we started, we finally, after 10 years of trying, we got Harvest Plus funded starting in 2003. And the first, uh, the first thing that we were able to show is that we could put these nutrients in high yielding backgrounds. So we've been investing in high zinc rice, high zinc wheat, high provitamin A maize, high iron pearl millet, high provitamin A cassava, high provitamin A orange sweet potato, and high iron beans. Those are our seven main crops that we've invested. We've also invested in these other crops. So now we have them released in 30 countries and they're in multi-location testing in additional 25 countries. So in three years from now, we expect them to be available for sale to farmers in 55 countries. So we have, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of breadth at this point. This is a map that you can't see all the detail, but you can see the green. Any country in green either has a crop released or is one of the, the 55 countries where they'll be available in, 55 in, in three years. So you can see that it's a global program now. We're, we're reaching in Asia, Africa, and also in Latin America. So the second skepticism that we had to overcome was that of the nutrition community. Um, the, there was skepticism that the bioavailability, the amount of the nutrient, extra nutrients absorbed would be high enough to make a difference. So we've commissioned 14 efficacy trials in the countries where the crops are introduced, fed them, you had an intervention group, you have a control group, the intervention group eats the biofortified crops. So we've shown now that the high iron crops uh, improve iron status. We've shown that the vitamin A crops improve vitamin A status. Uh, we have recent evidence now that the high zinc crops reduce morbidity under controlled trial situation in India. So we also now have the evidence on the, on the high zinc crops. Just to give you a, a taste of what some of the evidence is on the high iron, we did, a, we did one of our efficacy trials in India where we, we fed high iron pearl millet in a, in a school setting. And the control group got a low iron pearl millet. And just a little bit to describe the setup of the study, the, the intervention group got a pearl millet that had 87 uh, parts per million iron and the control group got a pearl millet that had 26 parts per million iron. And 26 parts per million is about the same as wheat. And that's what the children were, were eating mainly before they were, uh, came into the study. But we had a logistical problem. And after four months, we ran out of the control uh, pearl millet at 26. And they went out in the market and they bought another one. But then they discovered after the study was done, they did the testing, it was 51 instead of 26. But it actually uh, affected these results in an interesting way. So what happened was after the first four months, the children who ate the high iron pearl millet, you can see that their total body iron stores increased dramatically. I don't have time to go into the, to the details, but you can see it hardly changed at all uh, in the children that ate the control pearl millet. And then these children continued after, uh, during months four to six to continue to increase their iron body stores. But then when the children started getting fed the pearl millet that went from 26 up to 51, you can see that their total body iron also increased. And these are, these are significant levels. The children that were tested here as compared to here did better on their cognitive tests than the children uh, in this group. So just, that's just an example to show that yes, the iron is absorbed, yes, their iron status does improve, and yes, we even show uh, better functional outcomes such as tests and cognitive ability and work performance and activity levels. So we've done the breeding, we've done the nutritional tests, so what's the way forward with biofortification? 
So now, um, I said we had a lot of uh, breadth, but not much depth. We estimate that about 4 million farm households are now growing and eating biofortified crops, five persons per household, that's about 20 million people. But our goal is that 1 billion people will be benefiting by 2030 from the biofortified crops. We've mapped out 32 countries, and if we can replace 20% of the staple food supply in those 32 countries with biofortified crops, then we will have reached our 1 billion goal. Now, to, to achieve that, we, we can't do that, Harvest Plus can't do that alone. We're actually a very small staff with not that large a budget. We have to mainstream biofortification in a number of key institutions. So we have to get the agricultural research institutions to mainstream all of their varieties that are coming out, that are, that are climate smart, that are high yielding. They have to add breeding for minerals and vitamins as a breeding goal. We've started to get private seed companies to develop their own varieties and market their own varieties of biofortified crops. We've gotten international financial institutions, the World Bank is in their loans and grants to African countries. Now they're including funds for scaling up of biofortified crops. The World Food Program is now sourcing locally. In Rwanda now they're buying high iron beans and storing high iron beans in their warehouses for emergencies. Codex has agreed now to develop a definition and standards for biofortified crops that will help promote international trade. We've gotten the national governments of Brazil, China, and India now to invest in their own, uh, their own funding, their own programs for developing biofortified crops. And international NGOs um, are also taking this up in their programs. So that's how we're going to um, scale up. Now, this, this next slide is my last slide. And uh, this is just, I haven't talked about GMOs. So all of, our, all of our crops are conventionally bred, but we've invested in, in one transgenic rice. And this shows, that, um, this shows that normal milled rice is two parts per million iron. We, we couldn't do the conventional breeding. We could only get up to eight, but our target was 14. And you can see that we, ha we now have a high yielding rice, which reaches our target of 14 parts per million iron. But sometimes in science, you make some serendipitous discoveries. The same rice has also 50 parts per million zinc. It has both iron and zinc and far exceeds our target of 30 parts per million zinc. We're now distributing conventionally bred high zinc rices in Bangladesh. Maybe 100,000 farms are breeding, are, are growing these rices at 30 parts per million zinc but we now have something that far exceeds those levels and uh, also meets our targets in iron. So this is by far our best product, which is, uh, which is uh, transgenic. But we face all the political constraints of going through deregulation and uh, all the controversy that will uh, be associated with trying to distribute this to farmers. So this is the constraint that we're up against. So thank you.